in our previous video on jet engines, we have learned that just like reciprocating piston engines, jet engines do intake, compression, combustion, and exhaust. The difference is that in every cylinder of a piston engine, these events occur one after the other, whereas in a jet engine, these events occur all the time, continuously, and they occur simultaneously. In today's video, we are going to learn how jet engines have evolved during the past 50 or more years to become much more efficient and much more powerful. Now, this type of engine, as you can see right now, is called a turbojet, and by modern standards, this is very much obsolete. But something like this is not, because this is a turbofan, or more specifically, a low bypass turbofan, and nowadays you most commonly find something like this in fighter jets or similar military aircraft. And as you can see, even upon first glance, this engine is very different to our little turbojet. Now, the first and most important difference is that in a turbojet, all the thrust generated by the engine comes from the exhaust stream, or the jet of expanding gases coming out at the back of the engine. In other words, all the air that comes in at the front ends up inside the core, which houses all the key mechanical components. But in a turbofan, this is not the case. Not all the air ends up inside the core. Some of the air is bypassed around the core and never contacts the internal parts of the engine. So why would we bypass some of the air around the engine? What's the benefit of this? Well, to understand that, we must remember that jet engines are also called reaction engines. Essentially, they move very large masses of air. Any movement of any mass creates a force, and as we know, for every force there is a reaction force in the opposite direction. So the engine pushes air out the back, and the reaction moves the engine forward. This reaction force also moves the entire aircraft because the engine is attached to the aircraft. And this tells us that to move a greater, heavier aircraft or to travel faster, we have to move a greater mass of air within the same time period. And to do that, we can either move more air or we can move the air faster at a greater rate. Now, a turbofan exploits the concept of moving more air. And we have two kinds of turbofans, a high bypass turbofan and a low bypass turbofan such as this one. But when a civilian like you or me travels on a commercial aircraft, we are actually propelled through the sky by a high bypass turbofan. A high bypass turbofan takes the concept of moving more air to the extreme, because at the very front of the engine we will find a giant fan. This is where the name comes from. We have a giant fan and a gas turbine at the back, so turbo fan. The turbine harnesses the energy of the combustion and powers the fan. Now, because the fan is so large, it is capable of moving absolutely incredible amounts of air. And about 80% of the thrust of the engine actually comes from the fan. And only around 20% comes from the exhaust jet at the back of the engine. Modern turbofans on commercial airliners can easily move upwards of 1,200 kilograms of air per second. Because most of the thrust comes from the fan and not from the core, we do not have to burn ridiculous amounts of fuel to travel through the air. On top of this, modern fans are designed to be extremely efficient at cruising speeds and altitudes of modern commercial aircraft and they're also really well balanced and they offer almost zero resistance to movement. In fact, the giant fans and modern uh, jet engines of commercial jet engines, they're more than three meters in diameter, but you can initiate their movement with just one finger. The added benefit is that the large amount of bypassed air creates a sort of protective thick sheath around the exhaust jet coming from the core of the engine, and this helps to greatly reduce engine noise, but unfortunately there are limits to moving more air. The first limit is that we obviously can't make the fan at the front infinitely large. Some modern aircraft do have fan diameters which are greater than their fuselage and it is possible to attach very large turbofans to aircraft, but there is still a limit to this because at some point we get issues with ground clearance. But even if issues with ground clearance magically disappeared, you still can't make infinitely large fans because the greater the size of the fan, the greater the difference in speed between the blade root and the blade tip, because the tip covers a much greater distance than the root. 
In other words, an overly large fan will inevitably achieve supersonic speeds at the blade tips and this leads to inadequate and inefficient operation. This is where all bypass turbo fans like this one come in. Their bypass ratio is around 0.5 to 1, compared to the bypass ratio of commercial turbo fans which is usually 9 to 1 and above. A bypass ratio of 9 to 1 tells us that for every kilogram of air going through the engine core, 9 kilograms of air go around it. Conversely, for every kilogram of air going through the core, a bypass ratio of 0.5 to 1 gets only half a kilogram of air around the core. A low bypass ratio is employed in order to improve the cruising efficiency of the engine and increase the range of a fighter jet, but at the same time the majority of the thrust comes by increasing the exhaust velocity. In other words, instead of moving more air, a low bypass turbofan moves the air faster. This means that we are not limited by the size of the fan as with a high bypass turbofan. Here we have much more thrust on tap, all we have to do is burn more fuel to increase the heat of the exhaust jet, because the hotter the gas, the more it expands, the more it expands, the greater its velocity, the greater its velocity, the greater the rate at which we move air through the engine, the greater this rate, the more thrust we generate. But unfortunately here too there are limits, and this time the limit is temperature. At some point the gases in the combustion chamber will become so hot that they will start to melt the turbine blades. In order to prevent this, a lot of cooling air is added to the combusted stream before it gets to the turbines. Cooling air is also introduced through the turbine blades themselves and it envelops them creating a sort of protective film against the heat. These large amounts of cooling air mean that jet engines contain large amounts of unburned air. In other words, they run pretty lean to prevent turbine meltdown. Fighter jet engines make use of this fact in order to generate incredible amounts of thrust and achieve supersonic speeds at the expense of fuel efficiency. A reheater, more commonly known as an afterburner, can be installed behind the turbine wheels, where it can add great amounts of fuel to the hot exhaust stream. The heat of the exhaust stream is sufficient to combust the fuel and the unburned air in the exhaust stream means that we have all the preconditions to achieve near stoichiometric air fuel ratios and incredibly high temperatures of the exhaust stream. We don't have to worry about turbine meltdown because the afterburner is located after behind the turbine. The crazy temperatures achieved by the afterburner lead to dramatic gas expansion and insane exhaust gas velocity which leads to very very high thrust. Unfortunately due to the very high fuel requirements, afterburners can be employed only for a short period of time. The other key difference that you can spot between our ancient turbojet and our modern low bypass turbofan is the increased number of compressor and turbine wheels in the more modern engine. Our turbojet only has a single compressor section and a single turbine wheel to harness the energy of the expanding gases from the combustion chamber. The turbine wheel and the compressor wheels are all mounted together on the same shaft, so an increase in turbine speed will lead to an equal increase in compressor speed. Our modern turbofan does things differently. It contains two shafts running concentrically, one shaft runs inside the other. On the first shaft we have the low pressure turbine wheels which spin the low pressure compressors. And on the second shaft we have the high pressure turbine wheel, a single wheel, which spins the high pressure compressors. Such a two shaft arrangement increases efficiency. Why? Because it allows us to run different wheels at different speeds. Now each compressor and turbine wheel achieves peak efficiency at a certain speed or RPM. High pressure and low pressure wheels have different tasks, they offer, operate in different environments and therefore they achieve their peak efficiency at different speeds, different RPM. By having two shafts we can run each wheel set nearest to its peak efficiency RPM. On top of this, it is always a good idea to have more wheels and wheel sets because this allows us to harness the energy and increase the pressure in a more incremental fashion which in general it improves efficiency although it also improves complexity, uh, engine size and weight. Something else that you might have noticed is that the shafts, the two shafts and the wheels on them, they spin in different directions. Now this is not very common but it does exist on engines and when it is done, again it's an attempt to increase efficiency. 
A turbine or a compressor section consists of rotor and stator blades. The rotors rotate, the stators are stationary. The rotor blades sort of bite into the air with the leading edge and push it back as they rotate. They accelerate the air. The actual compression of the air and the pressure increase occurs in the stator whose shape diverges. This slows down the air. In simple terms, the aerodynamic shape of the stator converts the increased speed of the air into increased pressure. The problem is that when the air leaves the stator, it is not traveling in an ideal direction. So outlet guide vanes or guide nozzles are employed at the end of a compressor or turbine section to rectify the air and direct it in a desirable direction for the next set of compressor or turbine wheels. Unfortunately, these outlet guide vanes introduce certain aerodynamic efficiency losses. But if the next set of wheels spins in the opposite direction, then the need for these outlet guide vanes is greatly reduced or even completely eliminated. This reduces aerodynamic losses and it also helps make the engine shorter and lighter. But there is another reason why counter-rotating shafts like these are employed and that is to cancel out the gyro effects of the engine. As you know, if we take a wheel or a similar disc-shaped object and spin it at very high speeds, it will tend to resist forces which try to change its position. As we know, compressor and uh, turbine wheels, they are wheels and they spin at very high speeds in a jet engine, so the engine as a whole generates a gyroscopic effect, uh, effect which means that it makes it harder for the airplane to change its position. Well, airplanes actually travel at very high speeds pretty much all the time. And at these high speeds, uh, the aero surfaces of the aircraft, meaning the wing flaps and the rudders, they have a very high mechanical advantage. So they easily overcome the gyro effect of the spinning wheels inside the engine and pilots really don't feel any resistance or any issues uh, with controlling the aircraft. However, problems arise at low speeds when these aero surfaces have greatly reduced mechanical advantage. And this is, for example, why the Rolls-Royce Pegasus engine employs in the Harrier jump jet, the hovering jet, this engine, the Pegasus engine, employed counter-rotating shafts. The two shafts spinning in the opposite direction would cancel the gyro effect of each other, leading to no net gyro effect on the engine and no issues with the low-speed hovering and maneuvering of this aircraft. This is also important, for example, in motorcycles. Uh, Ducati is a nice example where they have an engine which rotates in the opposite direction to the wheels. So the engine cancels out some of the gyro effect of the wheels and this makes it easier to change the direction of the motorcycle at very high speeds. So that's pretty much it. There you have it. Uh, the evolution of jet engines through multi-shaft arrangements and bypass ratios. As always, Thanks a lot for watching and I'll be seeing you soon with more fun and useful stuff on the D4A channel.